Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome to another stu in the studio with Brad, where for the next hour or show or so, I will be showing off some of the stuff that I've been working on for Gibbon Games in the past week. I'll be showing what the end results of last week's uh, session with the scratch board, giving you some sneak peeks of artwork, and then we'll be diving right into the my latest picture, which is for Crypt of the Devil Lich. So actually, let's start with the scratch board. Now, hold on, I've got to sort through this pile of old stuff. Do, 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 do. I've been running around like a chicken with my head cut off. You probably remember this picture from last week. After much tor torment and a whole lot of pro white and such, I ended up with this. Now, just because, hey, you know, things are always a, a piece of torment, you see all these little squares, and you probably noticed these in the sketch. Once I was all done, I had the fun job of going in and typesetting this thing also. So this is what it will look like. And this is for Crypt of the Devil Lich. It's one of the handouts. Uh, I guess there is a key that you have to solve here. Good luck. Uh, the guy that gave me the art, the art order didn't even bother saying it. It's like, here, these are the letters you need to put in if you really want to know, and I'm like, all it's going to do is confuse me. <laughs> so there you go. Now, what else have I been working on the past week? As you all know, I've been working on artwork for Dungeon Denizens. And here's a couple of the pieces. This is actually just a printout because I'm not exactly sure where in the studio the original of this is. But this is a Dire Sea Drake. Let's see. see if I can get a little bit. There we go. How's that look, guys? This is a this was a fun piece. It's uh, I guess it's some sort of a gnomish robot. Don't ask me. I just draw them, and that's it. This is a companion piece to said gnomish robot. This one is still working in progress. I hope to get back onto this tonight. So that's that. And before I go any further, I would like to give a big shout out to one of our regular watchers, Joan Detroyer. She really liked the scratch board job from last week so much that this showed up on my front porch this week. This and actually five of its, uh, or four of its little friends. Enough scratch board to last me probably, you oh, I'm guessing regular use, probably three or four years. So thank you, Joan. Also, my wife, since it looks like scratch board is going to be a, uh, ongoing concern in my life for the near future. Spraying for some scratch board tools. No, this is not something, this is not a murder weapon, though I imagine if you used it right, it could be, you know, but you know. This actually was, I bought for, for trying to use for scratch board. It kind of works. It's actually a clay working tool, but hey, you can use it. And I found out something very funny. I was, you recall last week, I was using an X-Acto knife. Well, I watched a cool tutorial. It's like, I've got to learn how to do scratch board properly now. So watch, jumped over on YouTube and I'm watching this guy and he's talking about, this is like 
you know, scratch board for beginners. And he's talking about all these different tools that you can buy. And then guess what tool he ended up using to do most of the picture. So I guess I was at least on the right, right track that way. But it did, it did tell me a couple new tricks that I can use to make Scratchboard not quite so much an exercise in agony. So that is all of that. And let's get to the art. This is gonna be more of a standard traditional piece that I'm doing this week, because what I'm going to do is I'm gonna finish inking it, then I will tone it like I have done the other pieces for Crypt of the Devil Lich. This is an ice strat, ice demon. It's kind of a leftover from, God, when did the first ice demons show up? Like first edition, I wanna say. And I'm actually kind of glad because they've changed quite a bit since first edition. We have a kind of a an evil grasshopper creature. Armed with an ice spear. Sorry, don't you like this view? Wasn't that, wasn't that a lovely view of my bald spot folks? Here we go. You know, what's really bad is, uh, you know, you, I can go into a store now and you know how almost every store has overhead, you know, security cameras. Yeah, I just kind of like look up and see, oh, look, who's the bald guy in the hood? Oh, never mind, that's me. Oh, well. Maybe I'll be like uh, the, the late great Willard Scott, who basically just had a collection of different colors of uh, toupees, and he would just like wear them or not wear them, or you know, basically depended on his mood. If you you any of you you rem remember Willard Scott, he used to do the weather for I believe Good Morning America, and yeah, he basically just he didn't really even pretend that he wasn't actually bald. He just leaned right into it. It's like, yeah, yeah, I was running late this morning. So I'm bald. There we go. Hold on just a second here, folks. Now I'm not doing my normal hyper detailed inking like I would because I do want to leave the picture open enough that there's stuff that I can go ahead and paint. There we go. I mean, I'm leaving, I'm doing some detail work but I'm gonna try and leave a lot open so that when I'm doing the shading, I can do that with the uh, paints. There we go.
There we go, folks. And some nice detail work on the tail. Now it's been a while since I've done D&D, &D, so I'm trying to remember, and maybe someone can tell me. Have ice demons always looked like uh, evil grasshoppers? Or am I getting the, the mixed up with some of the other demons? For some reason, I'm thinking some of the details that I'm rem remembering from the past were actually for like maybe bone devils. I know when they started uh, going from second to third and further on a, up the line additions, some of the monsters got significant redesigns and I wasn't sure whether maybe the ice devil wasn't one of those. Cool. So I'm not quite sure about whether or not, you know, they all kind of looked like demons, but we do have a question from Miss Joan herself uh, asking okay. what kind of paint do you use? Ah, that I can answer rather easily. And I actually have two answers for that. Some of the, anyone who survived uh, high school artwork will recognize this. Your good old prangs. You know. But I also have these. The Dr. P.H. Martin's uh, rate, gradient, con gradient concentrated watercolors. These things are insane. They are so concentrated that like this container, which I've used a lot of comparatively, is still basically about 99% full. Um, a company I worked at back in the 1990s, a Game Designers Workshop, had a full set of Professor Martin's watercolors that they had had around the offices for like seven years before I had come on the seat. I came, I started working there and it was still basically, most of the bottles were still essentially full. Yeah, I mean, you can, you literally use like one, maybe two drops at a time. I gotta be careful here. So your basic eyedropper, yeah. One or two drops of this and you will have enough paint, you'll have enough pigment to do an entire painting. They are very expensive, but in all re realism, you buy a good set of Professor Martins and you'll probably never have to buy them again. Just got them for me earlier this year as an early, uh, you know, birthday present. It took me a little while to actually kind of get over because Professor Martin's, they're so good, and but they're so powerful that they're actually kind of intimidating to use, if that makes any sense at all. Yes, I know, you should not be able to be intimidated by a bottle of paint, but trust me, I was. 
but I am starting to use them. And like I said, um, yeah, this entire painting was done with one drop of brown or chocolate brown and like one drop of the slate blue that I like and one drop of green. And that was basically it, kids, to do an entire small painting. If I remember correctly, before computers kind of took over the entirety of the uh, comic book industry, and there were still some people, artists, that would basically paint their stuff. Professor Martin's was the preferred medium for colors. Now, yeah, you. There we go. So, uh, fun fact, we uh, okay. do have a picture in chat, uh, and I'm going to allow this link because it's it, it's comical to me, honestly. Um, okay. But it's what the ice demon in AD&D looked like, and it was basically the same deal. Um, it was what you're drawing, except for a fat belly. And um, just real quick, I'm going to show this off to the chat. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, guys. It's a little goofy, but you see what it means. That way it went on YouTube, you can see it. But uh, yeah, so you're on track. The Ice Demon in AD&D was basically that, but a fat belly. Okay, so this is the same, same exact demon, only he's doing a keto diet, I guess. There we go. That's kind of funny. So basically, this is the Bowflex demon. There we go. Oops, sorry. True story. Um, before I basically started working almost mostly for Goodman Games, um, of course like every other gaming artist, I wanted to get work from TSR. And this was right at, and I had contacted them many times to the point where the art director and I were fairly chummy, even though he still wasn't giving me any work. But um, finally one day, he calls me up and this was actually after I had essentially given up on trying to get them. So I hadn't heard from them in quite a while. I figured if they didn't want to give me work, you know, hey, that's life. You know, I've got other clients. So, but he actually con calls me at my day job. And he gives me. Or so he asked me if I was still interested in doing some work for Dungeon Magazine. And of course, I kind of screamed and said, well, hell yes. So he gave me the job. 
And of course it involved drawing some monsters. And then I, I, I kind of had to make a uh, admission that I really thought was going to sabotage my burgeoning career as an artist for a dungeon because I had gotten rid of my D&D books many years before. As I think I've mentioned, I'm more of a Call of Cthulhu Shadowrun kind of guy. And when I had moved out to Illinois to work at Game Designers Workshop, I had to get rid of some stuff. So I had just kind of like, you know what? If anybody, I have some friends who can get, get some use out of this. So here, here's my DMG, et cetera, et cetera, you know. So I had the rather awkward conversation, or I thought it was going to be really awkward, of him telling me I have to draw a method and, and a this or that and the other thing. And I'm like, uh, Larry, I, I don't know how to tell you this. I have no clue what you're talking about. And happily, he just laughed and informed me that they were not interested in hiring me or giving me this commission based on my encyclopedic knowledge of Dungeons and Dragons. They wanted me for my talent. And then he just asked me for my fax number. And, you know, said, I'll send you the uh, reference material over shortly. So, so I breathed a sigh of relief and uh, that was pretty much the end of the conversation. And I went back to work and about 20 minutes later, my boss comes over to my desk with this sheath of uh, papers from the fax machine. And like, I think these are for you, Brad. Oops, sorry, Deb. I probably should have uh, men mentioned to her that uh, Someone was going to be faxing me pictures of monsters. Oh, well, such is life. But yeah, this was many years ago before the internet. Now, if you need reference for a monster or whatnot, you just type in the name in Google and go. Yeah, believe it or not, there was a time when if you needed research material for a game, you basically either had to contact the company or go out and buy the information yourself. Happily, most of the companies were perfectly happy to send you any reference material that you might need. I remember the first time I did a job for Battletech. And mind you, this was kind of a tryout job. They wanted to see if, it, if I had what it took to do Battletech. And they understood that, you know, not everyone has a huge library of Battletech material. So a couple of days after I got off the phone with the art director, Hold on just a second, guys. I got to do some, do some, there we go. Had to do some quick corrections on a, the sketch here on the fly. I mean, it was literally like, I want to say it was like two quarter pages and like a spot yellow. And they sent me about $50 worth of books. And this was back in the days when, you know, your average gaming book was only about 10 or $15. So that was a surprise, a fun surprise. But 
it did give me all the information I needed to get the job done with ease. There we go. Let's do some shading here. You want to do some shading, even if you are going to let the inks do most of the job. Sorry, let's get that back up there. Sorry. You can tell I'm going to have fun, fun with some of the uh, highlights for this piece. And that's important, you know. Plus, after all, he's a demon, so. We got to kind of make him look sinister. There we go. One more. Deep, deep, deep. Okay, and I'd say this leg is done. Or not. There we go. I misplaced them over the past couple of days. Um, I actually, speaking of Google, I actually drew this according to a photograph of a grasshopper's head that I uh, downloaded. Here we go. Now, from what I could see of the photo reference that Matt sent me, they're not quite exactly grasshopper heads, but I'm not sure whether that is <clears throat> because that was what they were envisioning or maybe the original artist just didn't have the right picture to work from. I honestly don't know, but I actually tried to kind of strike a happy balance between the picture that is sent and the photographic reality of the grasshopper's head. There we go. Now I guess this demon is kind of a unique ice demon because most the ones that you see in the books um, just have kind of a normal tail. But this one, since it is for Crypt, for Crypt of the Devil Lich, of course they can't just have any normal, you know, gosh, didn't we fight at this, at this ice demon last week? Jeez, you know? So, Instead of a normal tail, it has a scythe for, at the end of its tail, you know, better for cu cutting your player characters into tiny pieces. I mean, isn't that nice of them to include little details like that? So 
So when you're running with your group through Crypt of the Devil Lich and your character gets reduced to like negative 30 hit points by one swipe of this ice demon's tail, you can say, hey, I remember seeing this thing being drawn, which will be a huge, uh, you know, comfort as you're, you know, rolling up your next character just so he can get killed too. Oh, sorry. I was a little bit too far in the zone there. Anyone that lives with an artist or a writer or a musician can tell you that artists, pretty much any creative types like that, you know, we can get so far into the creative process and that we, we're not thinking about anything else. And that's why sometimes even here, knowing that I need to be kind of narrating, I still kind of go silent because I just, I'm concentrating that hard on the piece. I have a friend who's a writer who his wife literally keeps a huge stick by the door of his studio, his writing studio. And when she needs to get his attention, she will pick up the stick and basically stand on the other side of the room and kind of tap him on the shoulder. It doesn't help that this guy is a uh, long-term martial arts enthusiast and, you know, surprising him like that could have really bad effects. So any questions from chat, anyone? Not at the moment. Okay. You've got some nice comments though. Uh, Grape Ape Texas says that you make a uh, drawing look so easy. Who said that? Uh, Grape Ape from Texas. Okay, <laughs> Grape, Ape, Grape Ape, Texas. <laughs> One nice thing, Grape Ape, I've been doing a, some of this kind of stuff for many years. So a lot of it has become second nature Also, by the time you guys are seeing some of this stuff, you know, a lot of the hard mental work of a drawing is over. But the really hard part is the actual, like, trying to transform a work order, which is sometimes only a paragraph or two at, or excuse me, a sentence or two into a full picture, that can be, that can be a lot of work. That can be a lot of mental work. And that's, 
but I don't think you guys really want to sit here and watch me going like, what am I supposed to draw? What am I supposed to draw? I figure you'd rather see the actual getting towards the end of the process. There we go. What I need to really think you guys might get a kick out of is before the end of the season, try and get one of these pictures like this done to the inked stage. And then I can show you what it looks like, you know, going from the pure actual black and white, the actual process of turning it into a tonal piece. Does that sound like something uh, you folks would be interested in? They are saying yes. Okay, good. I will try to remember that. Uh, we also have a uh, question from Sergeant Nasty 11B20, who uh, asked, what was the work order sentence for this? Oh, caramba. Um, I think it basically just said an ice deep. It gave me the dimensions, which are the original, the printed dimensions would be about 3.75 by 4.75. And I usually do it about a quarter to halfway up larger. I'm seeing if I can find the work order real fast. Of course I can't. That'd be far too simple, wouldn't it? Wait a moment, wait a moment. Ah, here we go. Oh, speaking of the reference material, I saw you just a second ago. I hope you guys are enjoying this lovely view of my elbow as I sort through uh, my the stuff on my desk here. I had it just a second ago. Where'd it go? Here we go. Okay. Okay, so I guess this is the actual official Ice Demon from 5th edition. Now, for those of you who were, who were asking, I'll get you more details tomorrow, but here are the basics for Monday night's drawing. It turns out we need a few more monsters drawn for Crypt of the Devil Lich, blah, blah, blah. This thing's name is Horagar. Ice Devil. Oh, Ice Devil, excuse me. Quarter pager, black and white, 3.75 wide by 4.72. This blah, 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 has an ice spear and a modified tail. Oops, I forgot about that. Its scythe like tail is composed of hardened ice crystals that inflict slashing damage and wounds that continue to bleed until tended with magical hearing or application of a healer's kit. So I guess I, they did mention that it was a scythe tail. And I just kind of missed it in the initial sketch. These things happen. So there you go. That's usually about as much detail as I really need. I've personally found over the years that if you just kind of top, you know, and I've found this from too many times and I've actually made this mistake sometimes when I've been art directing. If you top load the artists with too much information, you just kind of fritz them out. And I've even made this comment to when I've act acted as an art director that if you feel this is too much information, let me know and we'll work it out. There we go. 
I kid you not, I once um, had a friend tell me a story. They were doing a science fiction job, and I will not mention the name of the company or the name of the artist or the name of the game or anything like that, but the setting of the adventure was same a futuristic version of San Francisco, no big deal, you know, that's, but it was supposed to be a overhead view of San Francisco Bay. Again, okay, nothing wildly insane about that. And then the work order went into like three pages of detail that the artist was supposed to cram into a half page illustration. Like there was any way that you were gonna be able to get that much information into a half page drawing. Goodman Games is very good about finding the right balance of the information you need to do the illustration, but still leaving lots of room for the artists to breathe and use their own imagination. And I personally think that's a very good thing to do. After all, you know, you're hiring the artists to use their imagination. If you try, if you're hampering them from using their imagination, you're hampering them from using the skills that you're hiring them for. And I would go that, say that about any company. Now, there are times when you have to get kind of specific. Like I once did a job for Pinnacle Entertainment and it was their kind of like a dark horror version of the Vietnam War. I think it was a uh, supplement for their Weird War City line. Well, since that was all military stuff and it involved soldiers from a variety of different nations, that required some, that required a lot of research and a lot of detail work, you know, because you're trying to recreate something in the real world. Is this the right pen? No, it doesn't. So I spent quite a few hours for that particular job at the local library researching British uniforms, French uniforms, so on and so forth and all the different uniforms that, you know, US soldiers wore at the time. But again, that's different. You're trying to, you're trying to emulate an actual established reality as opposed to, you know, something from dungeon, something from fantasy where the rules are not really set in stone. And the more pre-established the universe that you're working for, also you kind of have to do it, get a little bit more um, mentioning Battletech. They have a lot of very pre-established imagery that you have to, you can't just draw a big robot and say, well, this is my, this is my Mac. You know, you kind of have to, you know, you have to, you have to play it there. You have to play in their sandbox. And I don't mind when the art director reminds you of that kind of stuff. There we go.
and in a good concerning Goodman Games, when I was working on Age of Cthulhu, that required a fair amount of research and a little bit more art directing too. Because again, that's an established universe and established times frame. You know, I couldn't just draw somebody wearing whatever because it's set in the 1920s. So I had to make them look like they belonged in the 1920s. And I spent many hours looking at books of 1920s fashions, 1920s hairstyles, cars. There we go. So we do have another question from Popper Not. Uh, what are okay. the, what is the uh, blah, 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 words? What type of monster is the most fun to draw? Personally, for me, and I think we kind of went and touched on this the other last week. I love doing zombies because you can just do so much with them, and because they have kind of a baseline of these were humans at one time or at least humanoid creatures how, how, how do i want to say this you don't have to use as much imagination to start with the starting from the template everybody knows what a person looks like so it frees you up to draw whatever you want to in terms of making them. <laughs> like if I'm having to draw, um, say a dragon, you know, now there's a lot of, like this is kind of what a dragon looks like, but even there, there's a difference between what a dragon kind of looks like and what a dragon maybe should look like. So I have to get past that first step of how should this basic thing look to start with. And I don't have, so I am, have to get past that. And then I can only, and then I can start worry, worrying about, well, how do I want to pose this thing? Whereas if it's a zombie or something along those lines, I already know how they're gonna, how they're gonna, what they're basically gonna look. So I can move straight to the pose and the body language. And of course the funness of, hmm, what do we want to, how do we want to make this thing really look like a zombie? That's one nice thing also when they, that when they, the client can send you essentially photo reference, like I was showing a few minutes ago, I don't have to spend as much time trying to figure out exactly what should this thing look like? You know, I already had a baseline, you know, which is why I was able to move to this fairly active pose Hold on a second, guys. I gotta thicken my line here for contrast's sake. So Popper not also asked, uh, so if you love drawing zombies, uh, does that include zombie animals or like a zombie alligator? Uh I like to stick more or less to zombie humans. You know, I mean, alligators are pretty damn scary anyhow. You know, just stacking, a, you know, making them zombies is just kind of overkill, if you ask me. I mean, and what difference is it going to make whether a zombie is an alligator is a zombie or not? They're going to try and eat you. 
you know, whereas opposed to like a normal, if it's a human zombie, you don't normally think of people trying to eat people, even if it does sound like the beginnings of a uh, really, really strange uh, 1970s pop song. I just don't think there's quite the horror element with a zombie animal. If you notice, there are very few non non comedic zombie movies out there featuring featuring animals. Nobody has come up with has done at least that I am aware of a you know, zombie version of Jaws. I'm, maybe someone has done one, but again, it just seems kind of like, why even bother? You know, if it's a zombie shark, it's going to eat you whether it's a zombie or not. So, you know. Okay, hold on just a second, guys. I want to check something real fast. Give me just a second here. That's what I thought. Okay, you are going to stay right here. And I'm going to finish some of these other details. But then I noticed It's really fun when you uh, sometimes do jobs like this, especially if you you can't just Google for all the reference material. You end up uh, having to go to the library and you know maybe ask the foot the people at the reference desk, and you can get some really interesting looks. Uh, there was one time I had to do a job for Dungeon Magazine, and it was of a of a mummy but not a standard mummy. It was like kind of a uh, mummy like you would, you know, find from a, well, I think it was supposed to be a, like a corpse that had desiccated in like a secret chamber of a room. I think it was something for uh, Ma the old Mask of the Red Death series. So I had to go to the library and ask them if they had any pictures of mummies. And they're like, oh yeah, we've got plenty of books on Egyptologies. Like, well, no, I need pictures of the mummies after they've been, you know, unwrapped and such. Not sure what they were really thinking, but they kind of smiled and nodded and found me my artwork. Oh, pro tip. For any of you who don't want to just Google for everything, um, go to the library and go straight to the children's section. Because the children's section is going to have the most illustrated books. Yeah, once I started doing a real heavy duty lot of artwork, pro like professionally, I spent more time in the children's section of the library than I think I had spent in that particular library period. Okay. What was funny was I was also doing a lot of work for Atlas Games at the time for their now, I believe, defunct Ars Magica line, which is set in medieval Europe. And there was, I found one book that was like medieval costuming and such. 
And I'm not going to say that this book doesn't get taken out very often, but uh, I kind of stuck a bookmark in the one book, in the book. And I forgot to take it out before I returned it when the job was done. Well, about six months later, I'm doing another job for Atlas Games. So of course I trundled off to the library and, you know, to get the, get the book. And uh, my bookmark was still in there. Yeah, I had been the only person in half a year that had taken this book out. So Jess is asking you to uh, tell everyone about the children's section of the library where you grew up. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I grew up in a small town in rural eastern Ohio, a place called Lisbon, Ohio. You can look it on the map. It's like the oldest town in Ohio, and that's unfortunately about the only thing that really makes it stand out. But they had the most amazing selection of books down in the children's section. And mind you, this is when I was, well, I was a child. But, uh, you know, I was always a bookworm. So I'm wandering around in the, there one day looking, you know, because I'd already read some of the Hardy Boys novels and some of the stuff like that. And I saw that they had a couple shelves of books on folklore. And I kind of knew what folklore was, but I thought I'd check it out. So... It turns out that dear old Leper Library had a collection of folklore books that would have uh, been very appropriate on the set of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It had books on voodoo, it had books on full blown books on vampires, witches. I was probably only the only kid in fourth grade that read, had ever read Beowulf. or for that matter, probably the only fifth grader that actually knew an official incantation for turning yourself into a werewolf. Why this was in a children's book, I have no clue, but it was. Um, the author's name is, of the series was Daniel Cohen. His, I guess he's re still really, still very popular, but yeah. Oh, the sucker's almost done, isn't it? Okay, well, all right. Well, um, just so you folks know, I will not be on next week. My wife and I are taking a much needed vacation, but we will be back the week after that. And I will have this to show and with any luck, I will have the uh, mentioned piece that I'll have inked, and we can, I can we can walk through the actual process of painting a piece. Okay. Have a great week. Happy Labor Day, and we are out. <laughs>